Scriptures Real podcast. This is a special edition of our podcast where we're doing a joint podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, friends. Welcome to a very, very special bonus episode of the One Minute Scripture Study podcast. We have, I, I think we have a new co-host of the show, Perry <laughs> Muelstein. He's been on so many times. He is now also a co-host of the show. But Carrie, welcome. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for doing this. We're doing this as a, as a joint podcast mm-hmm. with my podcast, The Scriptures Are Real, also, so uh, that my audience can meet Callie and Kristen, whom I love working <laughs> with. I think they're they're so fantastic. I, I've never done anything with them. I haven't just loved. So maybe if it's all right, uh, would you guys just tell everyone just who you are? Yeah, absolutely. So my name's Kristen Walker-Smith. I have to throw the walker in there. My mom told me to because she wants credit for anything good I do. Um, <laughs> I will not include it if I ever get arrested, but uh, I live in Idaho and um, Callie and I have been doing this podcast together for almost three years and we've got a couple of books together as well. So Callie, you go ahead too. Sure. So I'm Callie Black. I got my start on Instagram. I run the account Come Follow Me Study. So I just love talking about the scriptures and everything related to Come Follow Me. And yeah, I've been doing this joint podcast with Kristen and we love just doing these short, usually short episodes about quick takeaways from the scriptures. But we also love doing these longer episodes where we can really dive in with people who are knowledgeable and figure out what is going on in the scriptures, which I'm especially (laughs) excited about for today. Yes. And I, I think most of yours are just like really short, like everyone can fit this in and get mm-hmm. this thought for the day kind yeah. of a thing, right? Which is great. And I, I love Callie's uh, Instagram thing. I think you have like over 100,000 followers. I don't have 100,000 of anything. I know, Despite right? what I've told my children, I don't think I've even told them something 100,000 times. <laughs> I would say I've told this 100,000 times, but I don't think it's true. Yeah. And then Carrie, for our audience, so, would you introduce I'm glad to be yourself? With you. Yeah, uh, I'm Carrie Muelstein. I teach ancient scripture at uh, BYU and uh, kind of just a scripture geek, I guess, maybe is the best. Uh, my, my kids always tell me, you're a nerd, Dad, when I tell them, oh, but did you know this and this and this about that? Yes. They're like, okay, you're a nerd. Oh. But, uh, so, and I, I especially love Isaiah, which is what I think we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I teach classes on Isaiah. I, I've written a, a verse-by-verse commentary on Isaiah, and I, uh, everything Isaiah, I love it. He, he just makes me happy. He's also a lot of work, but he makes me happy. Well, this is why we're so excited to have yes. you on. Like, not only do you have a great personality, but you also are so knowledgeable. Like, seriously, for most of us, it's like we open Isaiah and we start crying, not because we're feeling the spirit, but because we're feeling scared. <laughs> and and here you are, you're Isaiah's best friend. Like, so we are so excited. And for, for anyone who is listening to this just after we record and publish it, Isaiah is coming up in our Come Follow Me study. We are about to face down this bear that we all avoid all the time, right? It's it's this great wall in the Book of Mormon for most of us when we hit Second Nephi. And so today we are going to blast down that wall. We're not just going to climb over it. Carrie is going to help us blast through that wall and figure out how to better understand Isaiah. So can we dive into it? Is that okay? Yeah, we're going to love Isaiah. We're going to love Isaiah. Uh, okay. This Come Follow Me session. We're going to love That's it. That's a big promise. Yeah. That's a big promise. So, okay. So yeah. let's start actually, oh, though. But he's so lovely. I, I actually do love Isaiah, but I, I want to find out what your history is with the book of Isaiah. Like, how did you actually come to love his writing? Because that's not normal. Like, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, I, I've been told many times I'm not normal. Um, <laughs> But uh, I would say I, I never disliked Isaiah, like when we'd get to Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. And I'm not someone who like read the Book of Mormon a hundred times before they went on their mission or something like that. I, I'd read it in seminary and that was, you know, I'd read it. I don't know. I just kind of read stuff, but uh, I didn't dislike him. But when I was on my mission, I had a time where and this would be one of my my uh, hints for everybody as they study Isaiah is to think about uh, and, and I've got like podcasts or lectures and firesides or whatever, where I talk about nothing but this, but to think about how Isaiah can apply in either multiple time periods or multiple ways. And so when I first started to love Isaiah, I sat, I was on my mission and I sat down with three different translations and I'd read the first one and I'd say, okay, how would they have understood this in Isaiah's day? How would ancient Israel have understood Mm -hmm. this? And then I'd read the second translation and I'd say the same passage. Uh, and I'd read the second translation and say, okay, but how does this apply to or to modern Israel, mm-hmm. to, to Israel today? 
And then I'd read the third one and say, how does this apply to me as an Israelite individual? And I found in almost every verse that there was significant meaning in all mm -hmm. three. And I just thought, this is fantastic. I, I love this. Uh, and that's really when I fell in love with Isaiah. So. That is awesome. That's cool. And I love that. And, oh, go ahead, Kelly. Well, I was just going to say, so Carrie just came out with a book. Well, I think last year it came out, but it's pretty new called Le Learning to Love Isaiah. And one of the things that you taught in that that really stuck with me is that idea of multiple meanings for every single verse. Like these prophecies aren't just about ancient Israel and they aren't like just about the millennium. It can be applied to so many different yeah. ways. And I think that's cool to realize, like there's not always just one answer. <laughs> Yeah. 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 My Isaiah students when in my Isaiah class, they kind of get tired of me saying, oh, all of the above. When they say, well, what does it mean? This or this or this? And I say, hey, all of the above. That's awesome, though. Like, who doesn't love a quiz question where it's all of the above? I love that. Well, OK, so <laughs> yeah. I've got a question for you then. Let's let's put this into perspective, because yeah. I attended Carrie um, did a BYU Education Week class about Isaiah. And like, I mean, his classes were so phenomenally attended. And so I went and sat through it. And you said something that had me cringing because you explained oh, <laughs> the interpretation of of a scripture and i was like oh crud i have interpreted it incorrectly for my entire life so and i even <laughs> did it in our book right and so you were talking about this scripture where and it's repeated over and over and over for all of this his anger is not turned oh. away but his hand is stretched out still and you were like there's yeah. there's this like misconception that it has to do with like god's always got his arm reached out and that's how i thought it was so can it yeah well in mercy right, right? Yeah, he does always yeah. have his arm reached out it's just not always in mercy yeah Okay, so are there times, though, because I think that's another problem with Isaiah, where we're like, well, what if I'm interpreting it wrong? Can we interpret it wrong? Or is it just like, hey, what it means to you is what it means to you? Well, uh, maybe some of both, all of the above. <laughs> um, Dang so, it. <laughs> uh, I, I think that there are uh, interpretations that are what Isaiah intended, and he often intended mm -hmm. multiple interpretations. But let's be yeah. clear. If you, so I, I actually think I know how this little myth got started, that every time it says his arm is stretched out still, that it means that it's stretched out in mercy. Right. Um, and uh, so let's let's just say, let's talk about that first, and then we can talk about the multiple interpretations okay. of that. Uh, it, really, the, the arm being stretched out is an image of action. Uh, so much so that, like, that's the hieroglyph for doing things in ancient Egypt. Mm. It's an arm going out. So um, th that's just what it means. You're, and so if he says his arm is stretched out still, it means I'm still doing whatever it was I was doing. Mm. And there are some times where it says I've, I'm showing mercy and I'm continuing to show mercy. But actually, the vast majority of times it uses that image in Isaiah, he's saying, I'm punishing you and I'm not done punishing you yet. Mm. Right. And we have somehow, and I think I know how, but I won't get into it because it's a friend of mine. But anyway, uh, started this myth that every time we uh, we see, read that, they were like, okay, but no, I'm not done extending mercy to you. Mm -hmm. Now, that is actually true. So if that's what you're getting out of, it's fine, because that is actually one of Isaiah's major right. messages. And he will always eventually get to that. So you may be arriving at it three verses too early, but it's okay, because that is what he is is he is going to say that. Yeah. Like Isaiah always is going to say that. That's one of his major messages that God, after he whittles down Israel as a whole or you as an Israelite individual, he leaves a remnant that he is going to spare and work with and bring back to him. Mm -hmm. So getting to that message a little early is no problem, uh, but I think you'll get more out of it if you see what he was originally attending and then see how he leads you to that image. Uh, but if you've been edified, by uh, reading that and had the spirit. So this is the key thing. Uh, President Oaks, when he was just Elder Oaks, and there's no just in front of Elder Oaks, by the way. But anyway, uh, I mean, <laughs> that's true. There's, that's, that's an incorrect saying. But, but before he was President Oaks, he, um, he taught that uh, it, something that I think is crucial for understanding Crumb Follow Me or scriptures or anything. He said, the scriptures are not our ultimate source of, of knowledge when we're studying the scriptures. They're the penultimate, which means the second to last. Mm. The ultimate source is the Holy Ghost. We are reading the scriptures so that the Holy Ghost can teach us something about what they're saying while we read them. So mm. if you are reading uh, something from Isaiah and the Spirit starts to teach you something, whatever the Spirit's teaching you is true. 
Mm. Right. That's that was the point of Isaiah anyway, is for the spirit to teach you what you need to know. And so don't feel bad about anything the spirit has ever taught you. Just be glad it taught you and you were edified. And now as you learn a little bit more, then you have the chance to be edified a little bit more. And then you'll learn something else next time you read Isaiah and it'll edify you in a different way. And uh, that's true of all of scriptures. It's particularly true of Isaiah. So it's okay that I published that idea in a book, even though it's technically not correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. awesome. <laughs> that's we, all I needed. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's an important yeah. point. I, I absolutely love that, that the spirit is the ultimate teacher. And that really is the point of it, right? It's not to just understand Isaiah's writings. It's to use Isaiah's writings to get closer to the spirit. Like that is, that's yeah. kind of the goal. That's cool. Okay, yep. so 100%. here's the question I have. What do you think is one of the biggest like misunderstandings or misconceptions for understanding Isaiah's writings? Hmm. Oh, great question. So, uh, and that will bring us into, um, maybe I can answer that by saying that there are, if I were gonna give three keys, uh, I mean, I've talked elsewhere about like, you need to slow down and that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't take Isaiah at the same speed you took reading the story of David yes, and Goliath, yeah. right? Um, uh, and and looking for symbols. But uh, I think there are three keys that people, uh, usually people talk about, okay, look for symbols, look for poetry. Most people kind of know that's a thing with Isaiah. So let me give three things that I think um, really will help. And, uh, and th- they each involve a kind of a misunderstanding or a misconception. And then maybe we can look at some scriptures where we will see examples. I love of that. Things, yes, that's awesome. okay. so, yes, please. So I would say, first of all, um, and I, I, I've said lots of times, and I just recently realized as I was teaching an Isaiah class. So this is the first week at BYU as we're recording this. Uh, so I've taught my first two of the classes on uh, some Isaiah classes. And I found myself saying things that I thought, huh. I wish I would have said that better all these other times I've talked about it. I'm glad I finally said it this way. Um, so I've talked about how Isaiah uses imagery, the symbols and the things he does. He, he, he paints images. So this is one of the misconceptions. Often we're looking for a literal fulfillment of what Isaiah says when what he's really doing is painting a picture. And often he uses hyperbole, mm. right? He uses exaggeration to paint the image. And we're like, okay, how does that real? That's not real. He's exaggerating, mm. right? Because he wants you to feel something. So he, cre- he uses his words to paint a picture to get us to feel something. And that's what I've said all along. Isaiah wants you to feel something. But this is the step that I, I should have been adding all along. So the next thing for us to do is to ask ourselves, what is it that Isaiah wants me to feel? And, and why? What is the response he wants to evoke in me when mm. he gets me to feel that? And that's the, that's the step that I was kind of intuiting, but never making explicit, right? That if when he paints a picture, it's to get us to feel something. Mm. But why? Mm. What's he trying to get you to do when you feel? So, for example, when he says that, uh, uh, well, here's one of the ones that we don't get very often, but a couple of times he says when he sees this image of uh, destruction, that it made him sick. That he had a hard time dealing with seeing what he was seeing and he talks about being weak in the knees or feeling sick because of the terribleness and so when he conveys he chooses to convey his own personal reaction to us he's trying to get us to feel something well what's he trying to get us to feel the despair that he felt and why well i would have to guess he wants to evoke in us the reaction i don't want that to happen to me and so what do i need to do different well i need to keep the covenant Right. And that's that brings us to the second one. And, and we'll look at some examples of all these things. But uh, the second one is we have to understand and you guys won't be surprised because we've done an interview together about the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. You have to understand the Abrahamic covenant <laughs> if you're going to understand Isaiah, because he refers to it all the time. But he doesn't tell you he's referring to it. He just uses bits and phrases from the Abrahamic covenant. So what we're going to have to do here in just a second is just give like a two minute list of some of the most important things in the Abrahamic covenant. And then we'll look at some examples of how Isaiah uses it. And I'd say the third thing, and I'm just putting all three of them out there together um, so that we can read a couple things and use them all together. Uh, So let's say this, one of the misconceptions then about the Abrahamic covenant is not recognizing the Abrahamic covenant. It's again, thinking, oh, Isaiah is really talking about people who build houses close to each other. 
uh, when what he's really talking about is you had so many people that live that you needed to do that because you were keeping the Abrahamic covenant, but now there's no one living in them because you're not keeping the Abrahamic covenant, right? So again, we're looking for these literal things when what he's really trying to do is paint a picture mm -hmm. of keeping or breaking the Abrahamic covenant. And third mis misunderstanding or thing that we mistake we make, let's say put it that way, is we take seriously the chapter divisions and the verse divisions, and we they they weren't intended to be there. Uh, I mean, uh, when Isaiah wrote most of this stuff, he didn't write chapters. It just flowed one to the other. And we often get to the end of one chapter and the beginning of another, and we're like, oh, okay, uh, let's. this is a different thought. It's not. I, I can't tell you when I was writing my commentary how many times, and I think it's the majority mm -hmm. of chapters, where I wrote the first thing I write in the commentary is, this is a continuation of the thought of the last verse of the chapter mm -hmm. before. And, and we misunderstand often because of that. Or sometimes we have these verses that we just, they're famous verses, and we read them, and we read them out of context, and we understand them one way. And when you put them in context with all the stuff around it, you're like, oh, wait, that's what he yeah. was talking about. We, we pulled it out of context, so we didn't, uh, didn't understand it. So those are uh, three mistakes that I think we make that uh, when we recognize them, hopefully we can do better and, and uh, have, get even more out of Isaiah. Okay. So maybe we should look at well, some and can I, I'm, I'm talking can I, much, No, but... you're not. You're the reason we're here because you know everything. <laughs> we're asking the questions because we don't. So, and I want to, because I my brain works at a fifth grade level. So I'm going to bring this down and restate it. And I have to apologize if you guys hear me typing in the back. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is gold. I'm just typing everything you say. <laughs> so, so as I understood it, the three things we, that these are keys to understanding Isaiah is first that Isaiah is not, writing out facts, he's creating a picture to make us feel something. And so we need to figure yes. out what is he trying to make us feel? That's number one. And then, right. And then what does he want us to oh, do about that feeling? Do. Okay. I'll just type that in. Okay. And then number two is that you have to understand the Abrahamic covenant to understand Isaiah. Cause he's talking about it all the time, whether he says he is or not. And then number three was yeah. don't give credence so much to the chapter and verse separations cause they weren't there for him. So just read it like one sweeping story, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are some some natural divisions. Right. He didn't sit down and write the whole right. book all at once, right? This the, it, it is a collection of his sermons really over a mm. lifetime. So there are some divisions, but but you have to figure out where they are. Don't let the chapter's headings th make you think that's where they gotcha. are because as often as not, they're not. Okay, perfect. So are we going to do this IRL? Are we going to, yeah. like, get into it? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's jump do in. it. Let's go to, to chapter two, Ooh, if that's right okay. Beginning. Okay. And and we're we're going to skip the famous verses at the beginning if that's all right. Um, I think people are fairly familiar with the the mountain of the Lord's house yes. and so on. Um, but we're going to start in verse five, which is right where most people stop reading chapter two because they <laughs> like those first couple verses. Okay. Um, so we've got chapter or ver chapter two, verse five, and he says, mm -hmm. "O house of Jacob, come ye." And let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's that's good advice, right? All mm -hmm. the time. And that's one of the major themes of Isaiah. Come and walk in the light of the Lord. Oh, I forgot. Before we do this, we have to go through our little things of the Abrahamic covenant. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. So that we, You're right. Yeah, so that we can recognize when he is or isn't talking about yes. them, all right? So this is like the super, super quick and dirty version. And then you just uh, need to go back to <laughs> Kelly and Christie's episode like we did about a year an and a half ago or something. That was amazing episode. Um, where we talked about the Abrahamic yeah. covenant and you get more information there. And I have, uh, oh, I should say I have on my, uh, webpage, which is a really ugly webpage cause I designed it. <laughs> I've had a couple times where I had people who are good at designing things, design web pages, and then they go their way. And I'm like, I, I can't change anything or add anything to this. So I just did it myself and I'm aesthetically stunted, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it's got information on it. Right. So that's what, what I okay. want is the information. So if you go to out of the dust.org. Um, and you'll find on there, I've got one page that's about the Abrahamic Covenant with all sorts of resources for uh, finding stuff about the Abrahamic Covenant. I've got one that's just Old Testament study resources where I've got all sorts of stuff to help you understand the Old Testament in general. And just yesterday, I got up one or Isaiah resources um, uh, where I'm putting all sorts of stuff, in, including I'll put a link to this on there. Right. So awesome. um, anyway, but uh, I'm trying to get lots of resources on there. Uh, so if you want to get more on the Abrahamic Covenant, you can go there. You can get my book, God Will Prevail, or several so articles good. that you can find on that website. Or, But like I said, that podcast we did together I thought was, was a, a really good one. Anyway, here's the really quick okay. version. Um, 
the first thing in the Abrahamic covenant is that God, through that covenant, creates a special relationship with us. And that's the reason for the plan of salvation, our mortal probation, the covenant, sending Christ, everything is so that we can have a closer relationship with God. Right. And, and eventually a fully one, a full oneness with him, like Christ talks about in the great intercessory prayer. So that relationship. So when you look for God talking about when he uses the, the, the primary phrases he uses to describe that are saying that we are his people. So my people or his people, that phrase, or he is our God or my God. Those are really the primary phrases to talk about the Abrahamic covenant in general and especially that relationship. But you'll also hear him like talking about forsaking us or coming unto us or us returning to him all of those are about that relationship so they're about the covenant really when you read those no that's one of isaiah's little code phrases for covenant all right when we've established that relationship with him then he's going to protect us and there are all sorts of reasons these link together that we're not going to go into here this is the, the quick version he will protect us all right but you also have to recognize that in the abrahamic covenant once you make the covenant and you keep the covenant then you get these blessings if you stop keeping the covenant you don't just lose the blessings you get the reversal so when isaiah talks about god protecting us he's talking about you're getting the blessings of the covenant when he talks about god bringing someone upon us to destroy us uh then he's talking about well you're not keeping the covenant so you get the opposite right? same thing with a, a, a place to belong or a promised land when you're in the land or he's talking about you being in the land then he's talking about you're keeping the covenant when you are taken out of the land and scattered that's because you've broken the covenant right um, prosperity and peace are part of that covenant so when he has images of you'll just have all sorts of uh, bountiful things coming to you and the forest will become fruit trees and things like that that's isaiah talking about you're keeping the covenant when he says you'll be destitute and and uh, like in chapter five he, he has the and you'd have to look up like what are the measurements but he talks about like a, an amount of land that should yield five tons of wine yielding five gallons right and and uh you plant a, a bushel of wheat and you get a tenth of a bushel back mm. and that's his saying you've broken the covenant right you've got the opposite you're mm. destitute um part of the covenant is that you have righteous rulers that will lead you to god and so when he talks about a, a ruler or that's a ruler of David or a righteous prophet or someone like this, I mean, a descendant of David or a, a righteous prophet or something like this ruling, then he's talking about the blessings of the covenant. When he talks about people oppressing you, foreign rulers taking you over, or even, and we'll see this in our reading today, and, and this is offensive to us in our culture, but in Isaiah's culture, you have to understand that the, what they expected was a, a male adult to rule over right. them. So if it says that a child or a female is ruling over you, it's saying, okay, wait, everything went exactly the opposite of how right. you thought. So you're not getting the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. I don't think that's, if Isaiah were alive today, I don't think that's the imagery he would use. He used the imagery that spoke yeah. to his people, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, is there, it seems like there might be another one. Oh, posterity. Oh. Um, when you have, when he talks about, you have lots and lots of children so many that you need to make your tent bigger and then you have to lengthen your right. cords and strengthen your stakes to have, have room for all these children. He's talking about you're getting all the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. When he says the land's desolate, no one lives there, only wild beasts live there. That's because you have no posterity because you've broken the Abrahamic covenant. All right. So those are the major elements of the Abrahamic covenant that Isaiah will use again and again and again. And like I said, look for those images where he's trying to get you to feel what it's like when you keep the covenant. Gotcha and to feel what it's like when you don't keep the okay. covenant. And I don't know that he means literally five tons of wine gets reduced to five <laughs> right. gallons. But he's painting a picture, I think he right? means you're not keeping the covenant. Yeah. yeah he's painting okay, the so picture, I've got right. a question. And because I have loved, mm -hmm. and anyone who listened to your um, interview with us about the Abrahamic covenant, one of my favorite parts of that was when you talked about Hesed and how God's not going to give up mm -hmm. on you and you might break your covenants, but he is always after you. And he's always going to, like, this sounds kind of, different it's like oh no you get punished and bad things happen it's not just you don't get blessings it's that curses come so how does hesed work so, with this i'm so glad you brought that up because i should have in included that in there <laughs> um part of the covenant then this is the last little okay. thing that I, I was trying to picture in my mind all the little lists i usually have so the last one is that god never gives mm. up on you that he will gather okay. you okay mm. and it is that that word chesed which appears a number of times in isaiah right. Uh, in some really key places. Uh, this is a, a, an idea that there's a special love and mercy available within the covenant for people who have that relationship with God. There's always a special love available with, when you have a special right. relationship, right? That's just, that's natural. That's how things work. 
Um, and, and President Nelson has keyed in on this phrase, mm -hmm. chesed, and he's, he's really been uh, using this as well. So um, one of the promises is that God will never stop working with you. So the purpose of all of the reversals of scattering you, having you be oppressed, um, bringing people in to, to conquer you and oppress you, or you having no prosperity or posterity. The purpose of all of that is to humble you so that you'll return to God. And there it starts again. When you return to God, you start the relationship again, and then all of the good things can happen again. So the point of all of it is always to get us to return to God. And because we're in a covenant relationship, he will never stop mm -hmm. giving you that chance. And that comes back to that remnant idea that we talked about earlier, that he always extends that mercy, always gives you another chance. And that's a huge theme in Isaiah. Love it. Okay, so all of the negatives actually are working towards a positive. That is that fair? That's exactly right. It's a punishment with a purpose. Gotcha. It's and and by the way, when we get to Hosea in Come Follow oh, Me, yes. look for that theme. I think Hosea teaches it better than anyone else that there's a reason yeah. for the punishment. It's always to get us to come back. Yeah. Just like when Gomer cheated on Hosea mm -hmm. and God made everything go bad for her, it was so that she'd come back to right. Hosea. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, so then can we dive in? What? Where are we at? We're at Isaiah Let's two. Now we're at verse five. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, "Oh, house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord." So this is a theme. Basically, come to God and receive His light. That's that relationship mm -hmm. idea, right? Now, verse six. It's probably. Um, better translated if we were to let me read the end of verse five and then the beginning of verse six with a little bit of a different translation okay. all right oh house of jacob come ye and let us walk in the light of the lord because you at this point have forsaken thy people or because at this point god has forsaken thy people the house of jacob mm -hmm. because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the philistines and they please themselves and the children of strangers so you can see the idea right there God wants us to have a relationship with him, but right now, and I say us, so let's let's put it historically first. Okay. God wants Judah, he wanted Judah to have a relationship with him, but they didn't. God was forsaking them because they were breaking the covenant by all of this idolatry that it's talking about, that they're adopting from the Philistines and from the people of the East, which are the Moabites and the Edomites. Um, but but he's the, the relationship is broken mm -hmm. because they've turned away from God to other people. They're cheating on him, right? And that, that breaks a relationship. Uh, and then verse seven and eight, you get this idea that part of their idols are silver and gold and horses and chariots. And then we get the idols and so on. But basically the idea is you're doing all of this uh, trusting in everything but God. That's why our relationship is broken. Now we get to verse nine and verse nine gets a little bit tricky. Um, it says, the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. Now, Joseph Smith changes this to the mean man does bow down, and the great, but the great man doesn't humble himself, therefore forgive him not. And so that's, that's a fantastic um, change, all right? We don't know, and I've just been spending a lot of time in Joseph Smith translation lately uh, and reviewing a book by Kent Jackson on it that I'll re recommend to everyone. Uh, but anyway, the, we don't know. Some of these changes are Joseph Smith correcting misunderstandings that we have. Mm -hmm. Not correcting it originally, but because we misunderstand what's going on, he, he corrects it. And I suspect this is one of those. So, but that's a great meaning to take away. When mean means common or the humble man. So the humble man, because he bows down, then God will forgive him. But because the great man uh, doesn't, then God won't forgive him. That's how Joseph Smith changes it. But I think if we were to look at this in the context, and this is one of those places where you shouldn't look at it not in context of the verses ahead of it. The verses ahead of it are saying that all of Judah is worshiping idols. And with that in mind, then we have the common man is bowing down to the idols mm. and the great man also is humbling himself hmm. to the idols, right? That's, that's the context there. Interesting. And since they're both worshiping idols and the work of their own hands and silver and gold and horses and chariots and so on, they're not going to be forgiven. Ah. And instead what's going to happen is they're, they're going to have to enter into the rocks and hide from God because God is going to come out to humble them. And we've got all sorts of images about cedars of Lebanon and trees and mountains and hills and high towers and, and ships and everything that is lofty, God is going to humble. Nice. And then in verse 18, the, the idols will be abolished. They're going to realize that none of this actually helped them. And that's something we have to realize as well. All the things that we turn to don't actually help us. All the, the ways that aren't God that we try and meet our needs don't actually meet our needs. 
Um, and, and so then we crawl into the holes of the rock because we're humbled by the, the glory and majesty of God. And then we'll get rid of our idols and our silver and, uh, and we'll quit count or relying on mankind. Verse 22, see she for man whose breath is in his nostrils, right? So, which is a way of saying he, he, he breathes in and out and then he dies. Mm -hmm. He's not, he's not long lasting. Uh, so all of this is setting up this idea that because people have turned to idolatry or trusting in the ways of the world and the things the world tells them are important, they're going to be humbled. And this brings up another really important clue for understanding Isaiah is we need to look at that original context like we talked about and what's going on in Isaiah's day. Well, in Isaiah's day, the northern kingdom is being in the midst of being scattered and destroyed right. because they turned to idols. And the southern kingdom is largely destroyed with only Jerusalem being spared uh, because they've turned to idols. But Hezekiah got them to take their idols and get rid of them and to stop trusting in mankind. Has, Isaiah accuses Hezekiah of that. Look, you're trusting in Egypt. You're trusting in all these things you're doing. Quit doing that and trusting God. And he does. Right. So these last verses where you cast, get rid of your silver and gold and you hide and, and quit trusting a man in some ways are a description of what's happening in Isaiah's day, but they also have to be a description of what we need to do as we try to stop trusting in man in our day. Okay, I love this. That's so, genius. Like I have never, I, I'm looking at, I'm, and my Isaiah is just packed with notes because I don't understand it. And so I'm like trying to interpret it as I go, but I've never gotten that out of it before. But here's my question is mm -hmm. I, get to be talking to you right now, Carrie, and you're making it make so much sense. But when I don't have Carrie Muelstein hanging out with me and reading Isaiah, how I wouldn't have gotten that without you, I guess is what I'm saying. And I'm guessing right. people listening to this are going, well, that makes sense when he says it, but what about when I'm reading it alone? And so could right. you like help us figure out how would I walk through it when Carrie's not with me? Good, so let's do that if it's all right. Well, and I'll, I'll just say, just, I guess, uh, plugging my, my own stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, book. if you have my, uh, my commentary, then I am hanging out with yes, you. Yes, that's true. This, right. But, um, but even with that, the point of my commentary, it's called a guide in a commentary because part of it is I want to help people learn right. to do this on right. their own. So let's, let's do that. So that was kind of a quick blast of going yeah, through that okay. chapter. Now let's, let's continue on and try and do that where I'll, I'll show you kind of how you okay. can do this a little yeah. bit if that's all right. Please. All right. So, as we go to chapter three, let's remember our rule that we're not going to assume that there is a break because okay. there's not. And one of your clues is that the, it starts with a conjunction. <laughs> oh, <right>? for behold. <laughs> for behold. So this lets you know it's a continuation of the thought yeah. that was going on before. So he's just told us, quit trusting in the mankind and in, or, you know, in, in the power of man and in the ways of the world, really. That's what our, our current idols are, right? right? The, the trusting and believing in the ways of the world. The way President Nelson would put it is getting all of your information from social media and other online sources mm -hmm. rather than, than making more time for Christ. So now let's look at uh, verse one. And, and why don't we have one of you guys read this for us and let's just see if we can kind of uh, tear it apart a little bit. And I'm gonna say, first thing you, we should always do as we're reading is ask, how are they gonna take this in Isaiah's day? How is this being fulfilled in Isaiah's day? And then we can start to extrapolate to our day. I vote that we so pick who, on who Callie. So you, you didn't know you're gonna get put on the spot. <laughs> hey, when I'll you read it. Okay. Callie. For behold, the right. Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water. Oh, so I catch he's taking things away from them, which is the reversal yeah. of the blessings of the covenant. Good. That's exactly <laughs> right. And in particular, and you may say, I don't know what the stay, he means by the stay and the yeah, staff, but fortunately he defines <laughs> yeah. it himself yeah. in the second part of the, the, the verse, right? He, he defines it. He says it's hmm. bread and water. And is that, because I attended your class, I want to know, am I an A-plus student? Is that some poetry right there where he's doing parallelism? Right? Yeah. <gasps> oh, I'm ready for the celestial kingdom you go. now. Okay, so great. So he's, <laughs> yep, he's emphasizing he it. Because that is a requirement for the <laughs> celestial kingdom. They will ask you that. It's on the in, test. In parallelistic format. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> so should we keep going? Yeah, but but let's let's also look clearly then. So he's saying he's taking away from Jerusalem their bread and water. 
So what when what kind of a situation do you lose your bread and water? And there are a couple different kinds of situations. Well, you could lose it through your own poverty or through drought, or you could lose it because I know sometimes they have this experience in Jerusalem. They were being sieged. They were under siege by the Assyrians. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you've got famine, right? Uh, drought, like you say, something happens so that they're not able to grow it mm -hmm. or because an army lays siege to you. Those are the two most common reasons that a whole city mm -hmm. loses having its food and water, right? And you can clue in, in the next verse, which of these it is, mm -hmm. right? The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, and the prudent, the ancient, the captain of the 50 and the honorable. And so, so, so he, he immediately goes into some uh, military imagery and he's going to use it in a way where he's trying to talk about everybody, right? So if he describes uh, people of war, but also judges and prophets and old and young and so on. He, he, this is his way of saying everybody, mm -hmm. right? But he starts out with this military stuff, so that gives us the clue that this is part of how they're losing it. And and when we look historically, yes, they, they came and laid siege to Jerusalem, right? right? Um, and then we get this imagery uh, in verse 4 um, and 4 and 5. Uh, so who wants to read 4 and 5? Do you want to, Kelly, or should I? You can do it this time. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, you guys better take turns. Okay. All right. So verse four first. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, and everyone by another, and everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. So that's going right. back to that point that you made about about like women or children ruling over you, right? That's a sign that things are out of order, right? It's supposed to be patriarchal order where a man's at the top. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and, and so it's the loss of the Abrahamic okay. covenant, right? They, they are not keeping the covenant, so they're not getting the blessings. And, and it's not just even on a large scale for like the city or the country as a whole, although it is that, mm -hmm. right? You can have children and, and uh, women ruling over you. Again, I just want to be clear. <laughs> I don't think that's a You're problem. You're speaking with two women. We get it. It's with okay. Their culture. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, I, I, I think we're probably speaking with thousands yes, of women that's true. right now. But anyway, um, but uh, the, the even on the family level, mm. like children are in a way ruling their parents, mm. right? Uh, so he's just showing you how everything is falling mm. apart. This is not receiving the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. It's the reversal yeah. of that, right? So. Uh, I don't, I would love for us to read this whole chapter because I like that, but we probably don't want to spend that much time. No, but you know what I'm noticing um, right now, Carrie, is we've spent the last mm -hmm. five minutes on what, five, six verses, five verses. So that's almost a minute mm -hmm. perverse and that not perverse, but per each verse. <laughs> and, and I think yeah. that's a, this is a great practice for how slow do you go? Like, this is great because we're not used to studying the scriptures this way. And so I love that you stop and you really think about it and you go, okay, who is this talking about? Why would he be saying this? What picture is he painting? So I love even just those five verses we did that we got to practice. Yeah. This is how it's done. So thank you for that. I love that. So can... And, and uh, just to be clear, I feel like we're going really fast. <laughs> so... Uh, we should go slower. Okay. Well, I was going to say in verse... Well, no, no, no. I mean, we, we need to for here. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think you're right. In take, verse take one, I have to ask because when we talk about taking away the bread and the water, my mind went to the sacrament then and thinking about oh. like on a personal level, having the sacrament being taken away or having that opportunity to renew my covenants being taken away i thought about that on a personal level what an interesting idea of taking away that opportunity am i on point anywhere okay. there well and kelly and i'll add mine so, too uh, carrie so you can tell us if we're both mm -hmm. wrong or one of us is right but when i read that remember it's always well, all of we'll see we'll see <laughs> but uh, when i read all that right. i thought of you know, living water and the bread of life. I thought of taking Jesus away, like not having the spirit with you because you're breaking these covenants. You're pushing him away. Like he's not choosing to be far. You're pushing him far. So are, are we off or is this how you apply it to yourself? Or what do you, what do you say about that? I, I, I think it's brilliant, but, but yeah, let's be clear again. So we, I, I don't know if Isaiah had that imagery right. in mind or not. I think it's quite likely he did honestly in this case, but, but let's think of it. I mean, I don't know if he understood exactly how we administer right. the sacrament, 
but I think he gets bread of life, waters of yeah. life imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going back even to Moses. So, uh, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we've got manna as the bread of life and waters of life. That Those are images that are used all throughout the Old Testament. So I think he certainly does. And, and that the sacrament draws right. on the same imagery. So he may not, he may or may not. I mean, he may have seen and vision or little deacons taking the bread <laughs> and the water around to everyone. He, he actually may have seen yeah. that, and he may not have, but either way, he's got the same meaning that the sacrament has in mind, right? I, or he's, he at least understands right. that meaning. So I think primarily his first meaning is literally you lose your bread and water, and that's the, the staples of life mm -hmm. for everyone, but especially in their day, like we have all sorts of different things we eat, but mostly they ate bread and water, right? So that's, that's the first literal meaning. But I think, remember that we tied it absolutely into the Abrahamic covenant. And what do we do with the sacrament? We renew the Abrahamic mm -hmm. covenant. Um, and uh, what are the bread and waters of life? They're what Jehovah gives us to live spiritually because we're keeping the covenant. So is that imagery that, that you both thought of automatically tied up in that verse? I think it is. Because it's about covenant, it has to be. An element of it is it the the first layer of meaning probably not is it a third fourth or fifth yeah i think it probably is um and so see you guys are so good at this already you you, you but again you have to understand that first layer right. to be able to really understand the the fifth sixth ninth tenth layers right so, okay but that's good stuff so, so as we're wrapping this up though i'm i'm thinking like as people are listening they're like okay well that's interesting i kind of understood isaiah but so what like and this is part of what you said what did isaiah want us to do what did he want us to feel so how do you how do you draw that out like what's your personal experience with drawing out the what did isaiah want me to do with this because we've read a lot of stuff it was fun but now how does it change us what's your experience with finding that in isaiah so, and this is why we're going to go back to that covenant. I find that more often than not, I recognize that Isaiah is telling me, you really ought to come back to God and keep your covenants. Mm -hmm. And so you have, but what he's giving me are lots of ideas of how I might not be keeping my mm -hmm. covenants. Okay. Right. So we just looked at where he was saying, you're trusting in mankind too much, silver, gold, horses, chariots. So I have to stop and ask myself, what are the ways I'm listening to the world too much? And when the world is swaying me, I think Isaiah is telling me I'm not really keeping my covenant. Now, no one keeps the covenant perfectly, so I don't want to make everyone panic. But the idea is to recognize these things and say, I'm going to double down on my efforts to have that relationship with God. Or let me put it this way. Stop listening to so much to all of these other medias and make more time for Christ. Right? It's the same thing. What a surprise that Isaiah and President Nelson tell us the same thing. Right? Shocking. <laughs> um, and, and, or if we were to go to the, the next part. Um, if we were to skip down to say to the end of chapter three, where it takes the, the daughters of Zion, and I think this really is kind of about the daughters, but in a way, the daughters of Zion represent the best that Zion has to offer. And so he, when he says the, the, the daughters of Zion have a problem, he's saying Zion really has a problem because when the, the best they have to offer have a problem, then, then we all have a problem. And, and he really paints this picture. I don't think he's saying that having bracelets and headbands is wicked right but what he paints is a picture of these uh, women who want so much to have the attention of men for the reasons the world has told them and they're trying to get it the way the world has told them they should get it um, and so he goes through all the things that they're doing wrong which is just really basically going about the world's values trying to obtain the world's values for the world's ways and then look at, at what we have at the end of that mm -hmm after he says these are all the things they're doing and and we often focus on well instead uh, because of that and note the reversals here right. right the the opposite of what you were wanting is what you're getting instead of a sweet smell there's a stink and instead of a girdle a rent and instead of well set hair baldness but now look at verse 25 we often overlook this and thy men shall fall by the sword huh. and thy mighty in war right part of what happens is they're trying to get all of these uh men and they're not going to both because their methods won't work because they're relying on the world and that will fail them, but also because all the men are going to die. They're, they're going to die in war. And so they're going to sit in the gates and lament. And then let's ignore the chapter break and go to verse <laughs> one. And in that day, seven women will take hold of one man saying, we'll eat our own bread and wear our own apparel and only let us be called by thy name. Right. That makes more sense when we don't have the chapter break there. We're realizing, oh, 
all the men are mm -hmm. dead. And so there's like seven women to each man because all the men are dead. And remember what they wanted was a man. And now they're in the situation where I want one seventh of a man, right? I, what I, the, I, I'm so far removed yeah. from what I originally mm -hmm. wanted because I was pursuing the world's values in the world's way. So again, I, this, so it's clear covenant blessings are lost, but I also have to stop and ask myself, my takeaway is how am I doing that? Okay. Am I doing this podcast because I want fame? And I don't think fortune is possible from podcasts, but fame, well, maybe for some less than for me, I haven't made a red cent, but, um, uh, but maybe, oh, I was about to say the name of a famous podcaster, but I can't think of one, so I guess I'm not that famous, but anyway, uh, there's a Rogan or some, I don't know anyway, but, um, uh, but, but what's, what's your motive for yeah, doing this? Yeah. Is it, are you pursuing the world's values and going about it the world's way? Or are you doing this because you love God and you love his children and you're trying to do God's will? Right. If so, then you're keeping the covenant. If you're doing it for the other reason, even if it's the exact mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. action, if I'm doing it for the other reason, then I'm not keeping the covenant. But the good news is all I have to do is read Isaiah. It reminds me, and then I turn to God again. I make that relationship better again, and I'm back in the covenant-keeping business, right? And and God will forgive me, accept me back, and I get all the blessings of the covenant. And I, I, that's that's the repeated message of Isaiah. So there are lots of little ways it will affect me. This time it will be about why am I doing the podcast and not time to be best something else, right? Whatever it is, but it almost always comes back to this idea. Am I really keeping the covenant with all my heart, loving God and loving his children? And there were verses we skipped in there about you're not taking care of people the way you should. Okay. Instead, you're spending your money on mufflers and bracelets and whatever else, right? Instead of, and trying to get men's attention instead of focusing on taking care of the poor. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, hopefully it gets us to recenter on loving God and loving others again and again and again, and always giving us hope that when we aren't doing it right, it's okay. Just try again. Okay. So again, I'm at a fifth grade level. I'm going to bring that down. Um, so my understanding from what you just said is that as I'm reading Isaiah and I'm trying to remember all this stuff about the Abrahamic covenant and all these, you know, like, oh, the parts of the Abrahamic covenant and everything that... I can be pretty safe when I'm trying to figure out what is what picture is he painting, what does he want me to feel, and what am I supposed to do, is that what I'm supposed to do usually is come back to the covenant. And the picture he's painting it is usually how I'm breaking it or how much I need it. Is that fair to say? Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. You just uh, stay, uh, boiled Isaiah down better than I ever have. <laughs> it's because um, I don't and, work and I mean at your that. level, I really Carrie. I really don't. <laughs> so I'm... So, I'm not capable of understanding. This is why I love. It. I've never done an interview with you guys where you haven't helped me say, "Yeah, that's how I should." <laughs> no, <been saying." laughs> so you keep saying it your way. Um, I, 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 I'm saying that with 100% honesty and sincerity. Uh, that's that's what's wonderful here. So I think that's exactly right. He is going to show us why we need to keep the covenant, and the different ways we're breaking mm -hmm. it, and that we can come back. And if I were going to say that there are two things that Isaiah writes about more than anything else, it's covenant and redemption. Mm -hmm which you could also say covenant in Christ, yeah. right? That's the same thing. Um, but it's, it's covenant and that we break the covenant, but that we can be redeemed and that's because of Christ. And that's a less effective way of saying what, what you just said, but it, it's still a, a, an important way to say it. So we need to say it both I ways, that. but uh, that's good stuff. Thank you for that. That was fantastic. Well, I feel like I'm empowered to jump into Isaiah a little more now. So thank you. I feel like, you know, there's so many different levels to it. There's so many different ways that God wants to teach us the same exact thing and to turn back to him and all the ways that it can go wrong. Um, and sometimes Isaiah seems a little doom and gloom to me. Like it's just, yeah, these terrible images of everything that's going bad and, and, bad things that people are doing but at the end of the day that can prompt me to like examine myself what am i turning to and where can i make those corrections and turn back to the lord wow. it's, it's well said and and maybe i'll just add this uh one thing there are portions of isaiah that are doom and gloom and there are portions of isaiah that are exultant and and glorious yeah. and hope but he always slips in a little bit of the other. So you, you look, you'll see it at least a couple times in these first, like, say, six chapters where he'll be talking about all this bad stuff. And then he just slips in. But for the righteous, it's going to work out well. Mm -hmm. 
or he'll be talking about all this good stuff and then he just slips in eh, but for the wicked this isn't gonna <laughs> yeah, work yeah. So, well, right? so he always holds out the other side just uh, 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 he slips it in in the middle of whatever long thing he's in he slips in just a glimpse of the other side of that coin yeah. right? yes and i love this i thank you so much for being here we uh we are like, we love the scriptures, Kelly and I love the scriptures, but I know that Isaiah is hard for us as well. You know, like yeah. we just don't have the same education that you have around it. And so your wisdom and insight on this is just so valuable. So thank you so, so much for being here today, Gary. Well, thank you. You always help me make more sense to myself. So thank you. Uh, I, I, I love, you, love being with you both. And uh, I appreciate it. I know we went a little longer than you you typically do or than I intended, but it's just because it's so much good, clean fun. It is so much good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Carrie, for being with us. And thank you, all of you who listened, for being with us and coming closer to Christ with us a few minutes at a time.